Ankataria Ung, Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion in the Social Science Division and Associate Professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome you to our fireside conversation. I would like to open with a land acknowledgement. The On the Same Page program recognizes that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chachenjo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the, the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muvekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. We recognize that the Mawekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and the broader Bay Area communities today. Before we begin, I would like to thank the selection and planning committees and the staff especially Aileen Liu and Heather Magiharju for making this event possible. And a special thank you also to our panelists and moderator and to all of you in the audience for joining us today. This event is part of the On This Initiative that is sponsored by the College of Letters and Sciences. The initiative is UC Berkeley's way of welcoming our new students into the campus intellectual community. So each year we feature a book or other forms of artistic expression as an umbrella theme for a range of courses, events, and activities that bring our new students into contact with each other and with our faculty. And this year's featured book is Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu. The campus has engaged a number of faculty and academic programs in curating a series of exciting activities centered on the various themes of this book. So this afternoon program is a fireside chat between two engaging academics whose works resonate with each other and with the book in meaningful ways. I will introduce them briefly because the bios are also posted online. So you'll feel, please feel free to check it, um, it out. Professor Tae Sing Shan, who is zooming in from Taiwan, received his PhD in comparative literature from National Taiwan University in 1986. He served as the president of English and American Literature Association of the Republic of China, 2000 to 2001, and the president of Comparative Literature Association of the Republic of China, 2008 to 2010. He was a Fulbright senior visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley from 2005 to 2006. Currently, he is Distinguished Research Fellow of the Institute of European and American Studies, Academia Sinica, the highest academic institution in Taiwan. In addition to being a scholar, he is also an experienced translator and interviewer with dozens of books to his credit. His research areas include Asian American literature, comparative literature, cultural studies, and translation studies. We are also joined by uh, Professor Andrew Wei Leung, who is Assistant Professor of English at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the translator of Lament in the Night by Kaya Press 2012. It's a collection of two novels by Nagahara Shosun, an, uh, an author who wrote for a Japanese reading public in Los Angeles during the 1920s. This translation received an Association for Asian American Studies Outstanding Book Award in 2014. Leon is also the 2018 recipient of the Association for Asian American Studies Early Career Achievement Award. And his recent publications have appeared in the New Whitman Studies, Comparative Literature Studies, and Verge Studies in Global Asia. We will have a short Q&A session following their conversation. And that session will be moderated by Dr. Harvey Dong, who is a senior lecturer in our Asian American and Asia Diaspora Studies program. We invite members of the audience to submit questions via the Q&A feature on Zoom, and we'll take as many questions as we can in our last 15 to 20 minutes of the program. I will now invite the two panelists to share some things about their works as additional context for the conversation. We will begin with Professor Shante Singh and followed by Professor Andrew Wei Leong. 
they will then segue naturally into the conversation. Professor Sean? Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, good morning from Taiwan. <laughs> it's seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> My name is Tejin Sun. I'm a distinguished research fellow at the Institute of European and American Studies Academia Sinica Taiwan, Republic of China. It's my great pleasure to be back to UC Berkeley for this very meaningful event, even if only virtually. It's almost a mission impossible for a person over 60 to give a very brief self-introduction, but I will try. I have played four roles over the years, scholars, translator, uh, interviewer, and uh, editor. My role as a translator came first in 1970s, and I translated nearly 20, 20 books. The first one was in 1977, Dee Brown's Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. And then 1997, it was uh, his representation as an intellectual with my interview with a book and also with my interview with him. And for my role as a scholar, in the year 2000, I published Inscriptions and the Representations, Chinese American Literary and the Cultural Studies, which is the first collection of, in Chinese by a single author. And then 2007, Translations and Contests. 2011, it was Said in Taiwan. And then 2019, Border Crossings and Local Practices, Multiple Perspectives on Asian American Literary Studies. And as an editor in 1994, I published a book co-edited with Professor Wen Jingho entitled Cultural Identity and Chinese American Literature. That was the first collection of critical essays on this subject in the Chinese speaking world. And then in 2018, I published The Feast of Splendor, Chinese American Literary Studies in Taiwan as a Ministry of uh, Education project to showcase the academic achievements in this field in Taiwan over the past two decades. And then, especially on this occasion, the, the year 2020, I, I organized a team of translators and translated the work by Professor Solin Wong and Professor Emeritus of your university, the Department of Ethnic Studies. So these are two huge volumes, totally 992 pages, uh, with 26 essays by Professor Solin Wong and my interview, long interview with her. And uh, as an interviewer, I published two, uh, actually five collections, and one of them published in the year 2009. Uh, by the name, In the Company of the Wise, Conversations with Contemporary Writers and Critics. Actually, that was mainly the end result of my research year here at UC Berkeley. So in this book, I interviewed, among others, Ha Jin, and the foreign four are closely connected with UC Berkeley, starting from Mason Hong Kingston, Professor Solin Wong, Professor Yiling Kim and the Professor Rona Takaki. That's really a very fruitful year of my life uh, while my family and I stayed uh, in Berkeley. And uh, how does my work relate to the themes of Charles Yu's Charles Wee's book, Interior Chinatown? And, so you can see I've been working on, uh, in this field for more than two decades, and I have translated a number of works. And uh, in relation to Charles Yu's work, I will mention nine issues mainly. The first one is about Chinatown as an invention or translation. For strictly speaking, there's no specific Chinatown in China or Taiwan. So in a sense, it's a transplantation, transportation, or translation of the food, scenes, images of China in a specific area in places outside China. Second issue has to do with image 
and the politics of representation. So it has to do the relationship between the represented and between the representer and the represented. For you have this image of each other or even mirage, wrong or falsified image about the other. The third issue has to do with inside story or the question of authenticity, whether we can have a correct, exact, or authentic picture of something inside. For instance, in such a complicated locale as San Francisco Chinatown. So I think uh, the writer Fei Ming Yi, who has been teaching on your campus, uh, uh, teaching cre creative writing, in her novel Bone, as she deals with this, and also in this interior Chinatown. So as the name shows, it has to do with the interior or inside story of San Francisco Chinatown. But as I said, uh, each one has his or her own version of Chinatown. So we may see different, we may have different versions about this. And the fifth issue is about types and the stereotypes. That is to say, for instance, in this novel, special characterization in this novel, we can see many people in this novel appear in generic terms, such as generic Asian man or generic Asian woman. So they appear as types, not as individuals. And uh, these types are closely associated with the stereotypes about Asian Americans, such as Kung Fu master or dragon lady, and so on. The sixth issue has to do, what do you think you are? So how do you look at yourself? So because the, the point of view of this story is from the second, second person point of view, instead of the first person, person point of view, which is more subjective or authoritative or different from the third person narrative. And also interestingly, is the pronunciation of the author, Charles Yu. Yu is very close to Yu. And in his previous science fiction, How to Deep Safety in a Science Fiction Universe, Charles Yu used his own name as a name of the protagonist. So in this novel, you have this Yu or Yu. So it seems that in, a, in addition to poking farm at also himself, it seems that this also implies some kind of self-interrogation as well as to interrogate the readers of this novel, you, you, especially for those Asian American readers. And uh, the same issue has to do with the tradition of Asian American literature. As a graduate from UC Berkeley here, I think Charles G pays his tribute to predecessors in this field. Uh, Matthew Hong Kingston, for instance, chapter six of this novel is called, uh, they are exhibit A and B uh, by the name of Laws of the United States. And then in one of the chapters in Matthew Hong Kingston's famous China Man, there's a chapter, uh, The Laws. So you can see this intertextual, intertextual reference and so, and also in this, it seems that the author wants to establish some kind of heroic image of the special male characters. And it reminds us as of Frank Chin's idea of the heroic tradition of Asian American literature. And incidentally, these two superstars in Asian American literature are also alumni of your esteemed uh, university. Question number nine has to do with uh, issue number nine has to do with paying tribute to Asian American films. So, in addition to kung fu movies, the title of Act Six, the case of the missing Asian, reminds me of one of the early films directed by Wang Wen Wen, the director of the Jordan Club. The name of that early film is Chen is missing. The last issue has to do with the so-called 
Taiwanese-ness of this novel. So he came, he, Charles Yu is a second generation Taiwanese American. And in this novel, you have some passages dealing with the tragic and uh, February 28th incident, which killed uh, is a thousand of people. And uh, the protagonist's father left Taiwan as a result of that tragic incident. I think the time is uh, up, so I have to stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Shan. I'm going to show some slides as part of my self introduction, so please bear with me as I get that set up. And uh, I want to thank Professor Shan for. Um, listing nine subpoints, which makes it easier to refer back to in, in conversation. Okay. You should be seeing a screen that says, we need a translator. So this is from a scene in uh, interior Chinatown uh, during a police procedural called Black and White. And uh, this stood out to me as maybe a topic for conversation today, where um, the white lady cop, that's the description within the text, um, and the black male cop, Turner, um, encounter what appears to be a non-speaking old Asian man. Um, there's this dialogue, do you understand her, sir, do you understand? And then there's the, we need a translator he knows something, even if he could understand us, I'm not sure he'll talk. And what I, I kind of liked about this um, is the, the joke that we need a translator is almost like uh, we need a medic or something like that, that there's some kind of emergency intervention um, that is required in order to uh, get the old Asian man to speak. And uh, even if he were to speak, um, it's not at all clear whether or not he would say anything at all. So. That um, might be a way to talk about what I do as a translator, which is a little bit um, odd in this context, since uh, you can tell from my surname, uh, I'm fifth generation Chinese American, but most of my work is on Japanese diaspora, in particular translating writers like this guy, Nagahara Hideaki Shoson, who was born in 1901 and lived and worked in the United States. Um, so uh, some of my work here is translating this novel, uh, Yoru ni Nageku, uh, translated as Lament in the Night. And uh, more recently, um, these kinds of plays, uh, this one called Sari Yukumono, or The Ones Who Leave. Uh, so in keeping with uh, wanting to keep this a little bit more informal and talking about the role of the translator or how the translator uh, comes to intervene in, in odd and marginal spaces sometimes, um, I wanted to uh, go back to what Kataria uh, started with, with this idea that land acknowledgments are important as setting the terms for where we work. And um, here I'm drawing from a statement by the Lawyer Students uh, Public Interest Research Group that says, land acknowledgments do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process. And we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. So what I'd like to do here in this informal introduction is to maybe shift the terms away from the black and white of Charles Yu's text to maybe think about the black and red or the black and indigenous ways of thinking about um, life and movement around land and languages in the United States. So a key um, figure for me in thinking this through is um, this text by uh, the scholar Tiffany Lothabo King called The Black Shoals. Uh, and it talks about a kind of ongoing tension between uh, black and native studies in the United States um, where um, Blackness is often associated with the sea and the Middle Passage or liquidity or water and um, Native American or, or indigenous uh, issues are often filtered through or understood through uh, the, the frame of land or sovereignty. And what Tiffany Lefabo King uh, points to is thinking about the shoal as an intermediary space always in formation expanding and eroding and not overridden or captured by the conceptual constraints of the sea um, or the land. And what I wanna do here is not suggest like a fundamental identity between um, an Asian diaspora consciousness and 
uh, a black shoals kind of formulation, but to start to lay out potential uh, parallels or, or areas for conversation that might be of interest. So when we talk about um, where I happen to be situated now in Kataria and Harvey and many of you, um, we need to think about the uh, incredible linguistic diversity of the native and indigenous languages of this space, which are also supported by the waterways, um, the ocean ways, and others that are within this. Um, and I wanted to think about this in terms of um, who I, I am in quotation marks or what role I play. So uh, although I'm fifth generation Chinese American, I'm also second generation Japanese American, which uh, places me in odd locations for translation. And uh, a kind of key formative moment for this um, was perhaps illustrated by this diptych. So um, for those of you that are familiar with the Chinese grave sweeping rites, or Qingmingjie. Um, this is an image of me with my uh, deceased grandfather with a Yuban coffee can as our incest, incense burner. And this picture is taken from the direction of my uh, great grandfather and great grandmother's grave. Here I am at about probably two or three years old, uh, just short of three years old, um, being uh, led to perform the bows of of respect to my ancestor. This is the same day that uh, uh, I and my Japanese mother uh, went to um, a, uh, a strawberry farm, Japanese-owned strawberry farm in Watsonville, and also incidentally the same day that my mother, who was in this audience, um, decided not to continue speaking to me in Japanese, but uh, to, to only use English as the main home, home language. So the reasons for this are, are complex, and I, I'm not going to uh, go into them in, in that much detail. But uh, I just want to point out that there are kind of complex uh, things going on with uh, the way that language is embedded, even at the level of my Chinese name and my brother's Chinese name, where it seems like we're supposed to uh, maintain a kind of um, a heritage of thinking about Qing and Ming and uh, purifying and brightening um, the, the graves of our, our ancestors and that kind of continual practice uh, here in a Chinese cemetery in Carmel, California. Um, this is parallel also to the experience of thinking about the um, less landed spaces or, or more impermanent spaces in the uh, Watsonville uh, slough areas or the Pajaro Dunes areas in um, further south in the California area. So the area that I'm talking about is uh, around here, Pajaro Dunes and Watsonville. This incidentally is where my Chinese American um, ancestors on my uh, grandfather, paternal grandfather's side uh, initially settled in um, this area called Pajaro now, or bird in Spanish, after the Pajaro River, um, but at that time was known as uh, Brooklyn and functioned as a kind of rural Chinatown um, in the early 20th century. Um, I want to point out a kind of parallel to thinking about ancestral homelands too, and this kind of uh, quote made famous by the uh, Chinese American historian or proverb, um, uh, made famous by the Chinese American historian Him Mark Lai, uh, which translates to drink water and know the source. And so uh, my family on that side is from this little tiny market town called Nam Long. And uh, interestingly enough, I, I thought about trying to learn Cantonese, but this would not be appropriate for learning my ancestral village language because my ancestors uh, spoke a, a Min dialect and not a Cantonese dialect. So they're from this kind of little tiny yellow portion uh, that um, speaks a, a, a Western Min or a Zhongshan Min uh, dialect, which incidentally happens to be more closely related to uh, languages predominant in, in, uh, in Taiwan or uh, Taiwanese um, Hokkien. Okay, so the businesses that were around there at that time were apple drying, uh, an intensely la labor intensive business. Uh, and the Chinatown at that time was formed next to a, a river which routinely uh, flooded. So um, the Brooklyn, now Pajaro area was subject to fires uh, that emerged from these uh, China dryer facilities as well as uh, frequent disasters caused. Uh, by routine seasonal flooding of uh, the river. So Chinatown in this sense was literally a kind of a space interface between land, sea, and river and water. Um, here are some pictures of my paternal ancestors, my paternal grandfather, uh, one of um, my paternal grandfather's sisters, 
in a, a kind of temporary, uh, but uh, here they're, they're trying to uh, establish a more uh, long-term um, school uh, set up within this Pajaro Brooklyn area in uh, the 1920s, around the time that the author that I translate more often was writing in Los Angeles. So uh, part of this is to think about the um, long histories of impermanence or uh, intermediability of how Chinatowns, historic Chinatowns can be remembered or not. Few traces of uh, the Chinatown of the 1920s in the Watsonville area remain. Um, I, I am thinking here too of the um, problems of the interface between um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineering attempts to control the floods and what might be more ecologically sustainable as a, a part of a practice of living um, with and a deeper understanding of the land. So that was kind of what I'd like to say by way of self-introduction uh, and uh, where I'm coming from or how you might think of, of me and my relationship to thinking about uh, Chinatowns. And now I wanted to transition to um, the conversational portion of speaking with uh, Professor Sean about some of the issues that both of us uh, saw in, in terms of, of these. And we can go through the format of um, what um, Professor Sean presented. So I'd like, uh, Professor Sean, for you to talk a little bit more about Chinatown as an invention. Um, what, what does it mean to think about Chinatown as an invention? Does it mean it's purely fictional or non-real or something else? Well, I think it's uh, partly fiction, fictional, but also partly real. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's in a sense is a transplantation and transportation or translation of food since images of China. And, uh, as I said, Chinatown is an invention just, uh, just as a fortune cookie. We don't have fortune cookie after heavy meals in restaurants in Taiwan or China. It's in the Chinese restaurants here in the US. The people will have these fortune cookies after meals that provide you with words of wisdom, especially from the Confucian and Taoist tradition. So here we have something previously unheard of, or I think invented in the US and yes, and they yet ascribed to China. On the other hand, you have also these images that actually were taken from since Chinese and so on. So you have something which is partly, um, uh, partly fictional and partly real. So it reminds me of translation in the sense, for instance, Robert Frost says that trans uh, poetry is some that poetry is that gets lost in translation. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, actually, I prefer actually two uh, lyrics from Johnny Mitchell's song, I mean, two sides now. There's something mm -hmm. lost, something gained. Mm -hmm. so in the process of translation, uh, you, Andrew, you yourself as a translator, you know that in the process of translator, it's impossible to fully convey the denotations that come with connotations of the original text. But when this text is translated into another language, so it has another association, I mean, in this new context. Mm -hmm. So you have another new linguistic, linguistic uh, associations or cultural associations, different associations, and so on. So Chinatown as an invention here, I do not say it in a bad way, but to see, to say how this idea of China is brought to another place. So in one sense, they want to have some kind of re replica. But on the other hand, it also has to be so-called localized so as to attract or patrons in this new land, especially in commercial areas and so on. So you have this one, which is really a very interesting invention, but which is also a translation with loss and the gain. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, something that really resonated with me about thinking about um, Charles Yu's novel was that um, the invented space or the um, architectural facades of Chinatown, like the Golden Palace restaurant, oh. or <laughs> the images that are, appeal to tourists 
also coexist at the same time as the people that have to live in what's described in the novel as Chinatown SRO. So there's this multi-story imagined structure um, where it's not just what uh, exists to cater to tourists or consumers, but also residents or um, the people that uh, live within the, the Chinatown as, as a construct. I mean, yes, the other yeah, thing that you, 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 were, you were saying made me think about is that many things are inventions or many things are uh, maybe imagined. So this, this might lead us to the work of like Benedict Anderson, who talks about the ideas of imagined community where the nation mm -hmm. um, as an imagined community. So the United States is also an invention. China is also an invention. So, um, you know, it's interesting to think about what it means to invent or um, create something new or gain something in the process of translation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I wanted to go to your second point about the, the problem of thinking about, um, we, we just talked about invention or perhaps imagination. And then, um, uh, this idea that you you in the written text you prefer, uh, prepared before about representation and the idea of imagology or the study of images could you say a little bit more about that yes actually image uh, this kind of idea is one way for you to recognize a world so that you can find your position you find your own position in relation to others so it's quite natural for us human beings to, to exist. And on the other hand, this has to do with how one group of people look at another group of people. So, how, uh, and also how people of different origins look at each other and they represent each other or telling stories about each other or painting pictures about each other. So as you mentioned earlier, so there is a special term for this in comparative literature, so the imagology, the study of images. Actually, this is not a, something very far from us. Actually, we can see it, this in our daily life. Uh, but just as representation, there is always misrepresentation, or you have image, or you have mirage, different different impressions about others. Sometimes it may be treated as a joke with little consequence, but sometimes it might have dreadful or even uh, dreadful or even fatal consequences. Right now, uh, I'm thinking about the conflict between, the current conflict between the US and PRC is sometimes compared to the so-called new Cold War between the American eagle and the Chinese dragon. So you have these very lively images, which are, uh, you may say, correct to a certain extent, extent, but also wrong to a certain extent. But this might have very serious consequences. So this is my idea about this. Because I was trained as a comparatist, I was trained as a student of comparative literature. So this uh, seems of great significance to me and the interior Chinatown seems to be a work that tries to sort out these things by giving us a very, very wonderful novel in written in the form of drama. And also there is also play within play, just like Shakespeare's Hamlet. So this is, I mean, interior Chinatown is a very interesting story. Yeah, I wanted to uh, draw out the thread that we were talking about in terms of thinking about um, uh, current tensions between the PRC and the, and the United States or the new Cold War um, and how the, the novel reflects upon um, a kind of key Cold War, but also US civil rights uh, moment. Uh, this is uh, a segment in, in which we're, uh, with the, the backstory of the character named Ming Chen Wu, um, who is a, a scientist or a training, uh, or sorry, no, he's, he's living in a house with quote, five other graduate students, most of them from other countries, Nakamoto from Japan, Kim and Park from Korea, uh, Singh, a Punjabi Sikh, uh, and then Alan Chen also from Taiwan. And, and another kind of play on, um, 
uh, words like you were you were mentioning before, you and you, um, Alan comes to stand in for all Asians. So what's interesting about um, what you were saying about imageology as, as a horizon for comparative literature is that um, anti-Asian violence in the United States tends to flatten national distinction or ethnic distinction between um, say, uh, Chinese, Sikh, Korean, and Japanese in, in ways that might be very strange within um, Asia where na national difference or ethnic difference might be uh, particularly heightened in, in uh, intra-Asian tension. And then, there, then there's a line in which um, Alan is uh, uh, assaulted in, in a, a hate crime, which is uh, something along the lines of, um, uh, it, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to find the exact page, but it's um, uh, all five of young youth housemates are called names. They compare names. Some names are specific, others are quite universal and they function in application. But the one that Wu can never quite get over was the original epithet, Chinaman, that one that seems in a way the most harmless, being that in a sense, it is literally just a descriptor and skipping a little bit. Uh, to where, where Alan gets beaten, all of the housemates realize it was them, all of them, that was the point, they are all the same, all the same to the people who struck Alan in the head until his um, eyes swelled shut. And so um, I, I'm, I'm sorry that that was a, a, a little rambling um, and that uh, the, the material is, is quite disturbing within that, but I'm curious about um, how it is that the specific imagery about China or other uh, Asian ethnicities within the United States gets amplified and, and, and turned into uh, something like universality or, or all of us. I think what you mentioned has to do with the idea of pan-ethnicity of Asian Amer Americans. I think uh, that happened in the 1960s and so on. So many people do not know, do, do not uh, tell very, I mean, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese American, Korean American, Japanese American, and so on, because they all look alike. So hate crime may uh, happen to this. So I think that's why the idea of pan-ethnic, uh, pan-ethnicity of Asian Americans, and also, for instance, in the 1980s, you have this uh, Vincent Chen mm -hmm. uh, tragedy. So he was mistaken as a Japanese American as a Japanese American, so actually he was a Chinese American. So it seems that history repeats itself from time to time, and that is why uh, is, it is even more urgent nowadays to, to spread a correct knowledge or to spread this uh, spirit of tolerance and so on. So to remind people of the possibility that that you, yes, we have image about others, but it might be wrong. Mm -hmm. So when you want to act, I mean, when you want to say something about other, about other people, or when you want to act about other people, think twice or even think thrice, or to be more mindful about your mindset, uh, your words and your actions. I think actually that's a lifelong lesson for all of us as human beings, not only in the US, but all around the world. So this idea of, of image maybe is a segue into thinking about your, your point about inside story or authenticity. So there's a, a epigraph at the beginning of act two of the novel, um, which kind of talks about this, uh, what happens when an image becomes uh, reality and the distinction between interior and exterior becomes uh, difficult to determine. So the, the quote is, quote, the performer may be taken in by his own act, convinced at the moment that the impression of reality which he fosters is the one and only reality. In such cases, we have a sense in which the performer comes to be his own audience. He comes to be the performer and observer of the same show. Um, and this is from the uh, anthropologist Irving Goffman. Um, so you talked about a comparison to thinking about uh, the novel Bone um, by our colleague uh, Fei Mian Ng. Uh, 
And uh, her idea of thinking about an inside story or an uh, interior story. Could you say more about um, where you see uh, dialogue or differences in the way that point of view or interior exterior uh, gets managed in these novels? Uh, yes, I, I, I love Fei Ming uh, debut novel, Bong. And the protect, protagonist of that novel, Lydia Liang, and uh, sharing it, the same surname with you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lily Liang was a girl growing up in San Francisco, Chinatown. And the story is told from her, uh, her point of view. In, all the, in one of the passages, he gives a description of the Grand Avenue of San Francisco, Chinatown, from a moving car. So I quote, looking out, I thought, so this is what Chinatown looks like from inside those dark gray hung buses. This slow view, these strange color combinations, these narrow streets, this is what tourists come to see. I felt a small lightening up inside because I knew no matter what people saw, no matter how closely they looked, our inside story is something entirely different. So this protagonist, uh, this female character, speaks from he, her own position as an insider of San Francisco China, saying, hey, you tourists come in here, but what you see actually is different from what we insiders see. So you have this kind of insider, outsider's view of a specific area. And uh, as you can see from the title of Interior China, that's why uh, the title Interior China readily reminds me of the, the uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, the quotation of, uh, but to me, as I said earlier, yes, in, in this, in this Charles Yu, Charles Yu uses uh, this kind of technique to show even the interior of each character and so on. So as, uh, as they did in Chinatown, so it also represents some kind of interior Chinatown with people, with these people around. And so they have really this inside view or interior uh, understanding mm -hmm. of Chinatown. But still, this might be different. I mean, different from each other. You mean those who are, uh, in, in this novel, you have people who are successful, climb up this social ladder and so on, and those who are below. And also people, for instance, even in San Francisco, Chinatown, in this novel, you have the cop show, I mean, black and white. So here you have this binary opposition between black and white presented in a play, but also you have Willis Wu, who is a minor character here. So where does this Asian stand in relation to black and white or in opposition to these two and who are also in binary opposition? So I think the uh, interior Chinata presents a very complicated story from inside by way of and, uh, writing this, uh, this novel uh, in the form of a play. So you have each person speaks about his or her own idea, speaks his or her own mind, and they are relating to each other, and they reflect part of the so-called interior Chinatown, but which might be different from other people's image or understanding or version of Chinatown. I, I think that's a, a really great way of talking about what the play format or script format mm -hmm. Um, yeah. does and in, in your uh, two next points uh, and this is probably the, the last thing that we'll talk about before opening it uh, up to Harvey moderating the Q&A session um, is about uh, transgression and then uh, the idea of types and stereotypes so um, there's a lot to go through here but I mean one thing to uh, that that struck me is that the, the same word that you, we use to describe literary genres like poetry, drama, and novel is what is the root of generic, or like the character generic Asian man or a uh, nameless Asian uh, a woman. And that genre and, and type can be a little bit 
different. So um, in some languages you talk about like, uh, like in French, there's a, a genre human, like for um, humankind. So genre is just like a, a rough synonym for um, English kind. Um, and uh, type or typicality is a little bit different from, from stereotype. Like, uh, you know, Engels uh, writing to um, uh, the novelist Margaret Harkness talks about one of the good things about realism or a signature characteristic of realism as a, a kind of literary representation is that uh, it represents typical characters in typical circumstances. So, um, What's your take on some of the differences between thinking about literary genre versus humankind and then type versus stereotype? Uh, literary genre, actually, I, be, uh, I basically follow the established convention that is, for instance, for genres, poetry, prose, fiction, and drama. So interior Chinatown, uh, as a so-called novel, but written in a form of drama or play. So you have this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of very weird, and even the format, I, I mean, the type script. I mean, even you just look at the appearance of this book, you can see it's like a type script and so on. So it's very interesting. In, in addition to the content, also the form, these two match so perfectly just to produce this wonderful novel, which is a winner, uh, uh, which won the American uh, Book Award of 2020. So in this, I think your, your question is very complicated, but as for me, as a, as a literature scholar, I know that the conventionally there are four genres, but still conventions are established to be broken. So in this novel, uh, Charles Lee tries to go beyond this. So to him, he's an act or to him is an act or an art of transgression or border crossing, not to be confined by established literary genres. As so our types and stereotypes, so, <clears throat> uh, I mainly draw this impression from the novel because <clears throat> you had generic Asian men and generic Asian women and so on, and the deprived of individuality, these people appear just as types, not individuals. Just as, for instance, in, Edi um, in Edison's uh, Invisible Man, Ralph Edison's Invisible Man, he says, okay, I am invisible simply, uh, the blacks are invisible simply because people refuse to see us. So here, uh, at least so far, this novel, Interior Chinatown is concerned, it seems that you can say, okay, we are typical or we are vague sim simply because you refuse to see us as we are. You refuse to see our real faces, to see us as real human beings. So in this case, it has to do with stereotypes, that is to say, when you refuse or when you are unable to see people as each individual, as an individual person with his or her characteristics, then you see them as types. So it's a convenient way to, to, to know the world, but also there's a risk. Let us say, especially when you have some very strong impression or opinion, opinions about these types, it might lead you to do something which is not which is not so harmonious, to say the least. So it maybe you have this kind of stereotypes about certain kind of people, then when you meet them, then you might have something which you know, some actions which you might not take when you see people of your same kind or your same type. So that's why we should be aware of the types and also the risk of stereotypes be always mindful and remind ourselves about the possibility of that we might have this wrong impression about us. us. So we must be mindful about all this. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks so much, Professor Shan. And uh, let's uh, bring Harvey on to 
um, help moderate the Q&A and, and guide us through the, the next segment of, of, our, of our, our presentations. Yeah, thank you for your, uh, your enlightening uh, presentations and the uh, discussion back and forth. And it, it, it covers a lot of uh, uh, territory. Uh, myself, I'm, I'm I'm not so much into literature, but uh, but reading the book, it 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 really does connect with you know all other disciplines, you know, especially in the social sciences, and and for the community, and um, so so I think right now, if there's members of the audience that wish to submit questions, you can do so in the Q and A feature within Zoom. And we'll take as many questions uh, as we can. Um, <clears throat> I, I can start with a, a question. Um, see, both of you are in different locations and you reach different peoples and, you, and you've read the book and you, you analyzed it and translated it. But I was just wondering in terms of um, what, what has been the responses from students, colleagues, um, and people that you know, uh, with regard to the book itself, and and, and and are people receiving similar messages from the book that it's a great book, we should read it and learn from it, or are, are people saying that it's it's it it it's not anything united around it? Yeah. So so Andrews teaches uh, here at UC Berkeley campus. Lots of uh, students uh, interested in Asian American lit. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Professor Shan is in Taiwan, more of an international audience. But at the same time, uh, he did live here for a number of years, right? You, you mentioned in the Bay Area when you were a visiting scholar. Yeah. So, so what has been the responses to the book so far and the questions that people have? Andrew first. OK. So <laughs> I feel a little bit bad about this because I'm I'm on sabbatical and haven't taught this particular novel yet. Yeah. So I, I I can't answer on on behalf of, of students. What I I so I I, I defer to um, Professor Sean mostly on this question. I I would say that it the novel really reminds me a lot about uh, some sections of Karen Teyamashita's I Hotel, um, mm -hmm. which also plays around with genre and uh, recollections of. Um, although this novel's flashbacks are concentrated in the 1960s, uh, Karen Teyamashita also looks at uh, an international hotel space, which um, overlaps with uh, the idea of interior Chinatown SRO in interesting ways. So anybody looking for like a good undergraduate honors thesis or a dissertation topic, like a comparison of interiority and spatial thinking in Interior Chinatown and Karen Teyamashita's book could be um, uh, really interesting. Uh, Professor Shan. Okay. <clears throat> I think people in Taiwan mainly read in translation. And the term translation in Sanskrit actually means uh, saying after or saying again. So here is a time lag in terms of translation. And also, I would say something about the cultural production of this novel in Taiwan. And actually, I was approached by the publisher in Taiwan this, this year uh, to write an introduction to the Chinese translation. The, Chinese, the title of the Chinese translation is Nei Jing Tang Ren Jie. Tang Ren Jie means Chinatown. Tang Ren means Tang people, Tang Ren Street. And you have this interior, inside view or inside scene, Nei Jing. I will, approached by the publisher to write an introduction for this uh, not too long before 2022 Taipei International Book Exhibition. Uh, I mean, last June, when the COVID-19 pandemic was posing a serious threat to people around the world. I, and usually I do not accept this kind of introduction or to write an introduction or preface at such a short notice, actually only two weeks. Uh, uh, however, the subject of the novel, I mean, Chinatown, had to do with what I have been researching over the years, and especially the ethnic background of the author, Charles Wee, 
who is a Taiwanese American. So these two are of special interest to me. And also at the publisher contact me, she said that the threshold, threshold for reading this novel is rather tall. So it's not so easy because I, I, as I mentioned earlier, it is a trans, uh, transgression of genres. So you have this novel written in the form of play. I also play within play. So it might be difficult for for a Chinese audience, Chinese speaking audience, to accept uh, to accept this kind of uh, some kind of challenging reading test. So she wants wanted me to write an introduction. So that and moreover, the theme and structure and techniques are so unconventional. You know, so that uh, they might be challenging to those who are not familiar with literary traditions or with the tradition of Asian American literature. So I accepted the invitation, wrote an introduction, attended the book exhibition, I talked to Charles Yu right there by internet. And all these experiences are very new to me. And also today's experience is also new to me. <laughs> Thank you for your invitation for this very lively exchanges. Okay. I, I was wondering, um, um, it, messages, let's say the mess, one of the key messages in the book is racism and stereotyping in interior Chinatown. Uh, does, would you say that it is difficult for people overseas to understand that? You know, because how they view America as being uh, something different, you know, freedom, democracy, that type of thing. It, it, so, so then you have Charles Yu uh, bringing out, you know, a lot of the, the bad things, you know, um, the racism, the violence, and does the, is it difficult for people to understand that or, and yeah. <laughs> And that's one of the problems or issues or? Yes, it, it depends on who, who mm -hmm. reads a novel. Mm -hmm. I mean, for general audience, yes, it's difficult because we have this image, uh, this image of uh, the US as a land of opportunities uh, uh, and so on, uh, marked by liberty and freedom mm -hmm. and tolerance and so on. So for general audience, it might, this novel might pose some um, challenges. But for students of Asian American literature, we have read quite a number of works uh, following this line. So for students of Asian American literature, mainly in the English departments, it might not be so challenging. Mm -hmm. okay. And then uh, similarly for for Andrew, there there is a number of um, international students taking classes in in Berkeley, and I was just wondering what 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 would be responses of those students towards, let's say, you, you mentioned uh, I Hotel or uh, books that that cover you know Asian American type of stories. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> It's a, it's a really great question, and I don't want to generalize on, on mm -hmm. behalf of, of my students. Um, I, I'll instead frame it in, in terms of uh, thinking about that there are images and movie types that might be distributed more broadly. The novel has a, a great section about what um, the protagonist's mother's image of the United States is through film stereotypes or like glamorous stereotypes of um, Natalie Wood or, or other things like that. Um, and even though those are uh, um, positive stere stereotypes or positive roles in some ways, they're also, and the, the novel is really good about thinking through this, they're also traps. Even the, the kind of horizon that Willis Wu has of becoming Kung Fu guy, which is like the top level of all possible stereotypes within um, his career as a struggling actor um, is, is uh, difficult. So I think that for international students coming to the United States, part of that is 
you know, there's a lot of US oriented pop culture or media or other kinds of representations. Some of that might get filtered with emphasis on, you know, uh, US action movies or stereotypes about criminality or, uh, you know, the, the uh, something that's kind of uh, interesting about black and white is that it sends up in particular police procedurals. So if anybody you say were to watch Law and Order in, in the United States syndicated or distributed elsewhere. I mean, my uncle in Japan is a huge fan of a series called Cold Case. And so the stereotypes are images about the effectiveness or the doggedness or the um, role that police and law enforcement play in the United States might be things to confront or work through in, in class. Okay. Well, it looks like... Um... That's a copy of the book. Okay. Yes, a copy of the Chinese translation yeah. of this book. So you can compare. This is the English version, and this is a Chinese version. Still, you, you have this arc, and also you have a camera here. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the introduction, which is entitled Inside of Inside and Outside of Outside. Mm -hmm. With the interiority and the, the exteriority. Okay. The, let's see, any other questions from the audience? Um, so if not, I, let's see, we can wrap up a little bit early. And um, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, Professor Shan Te Xin um, <clears throat> for taking time to talk to us and Professor Andrew Wei Leong, who's actually on sabbatical and <laughs> is volunteering <laughs> time. To, to be to be in this discussion, you know, thanks thanks a lot, and uh, best of luck in your 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 future uh, writing projects. Um, and let's see. Um, on the same page program, I want to thank Eileen, uh, Liu, and and the team. And uh, please visit the program's uh, website at onthesamepage.berkeley.edu. Uh, for other events, and make sure you purchase a copy of uh, Interior Chinatown. It's available, I'll give a plug, uh, at Eastwind Books of Berkeley, and Charles Yu actually has signed uh, book plates. So if you, if, you, if you were to go there and buy a copy, you would also get his signature, okay? And we'll see you at the, uh, the next event, okay? So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.